Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1977 Japanese horror comedy film, House. Now, this is a film I'd heard a lot about from a few people uh, who kept saying, hey, have you seen House? Have you seen that Japanese film, House? It's nuts. It's crazy. It's wacky. And that's the thing. Like, it is wacky. It is out there. It is crazy. So this is one of those films I'm going to have to uh, rate in two ways. One as a film as a whole and one as a kind of so bad it's good type film. Because I don't know a whole lot of people who aren't into, like, super into horror films and wacky films that would watch this and be like, I love that film. But I enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. Uh, I'm glad I finally watched this film. And in this review, I'm going to do the best I can to cover it. Because it's so wacky, so crazy, so left field and out there that I have some ideas about what was at play here. But, you know, who really knows ultimately? So obviously there will be spoilers because it's an older film, so just know that. Directed by Nobuhiko Obayashi, uh, who has 59 directing credits on IMDb, so pretty prolific. I knew he did a lot of commercials in addition to that. In fact, a lot of the casting for this film came from commercials he was shooting, and he would just take people from and be like, oh, you're doing a great job with this commercial. Do you want to be in this film house? So just some interesting info. This was written by Chiho Katsura who has 50 writing credits on IMDb, some of them being porn um, or like a, you know, softcore porn type films from Japan, older ones, but also some other collaborations with Obayashi for regular films. Uh, and this was actually taken, um, taken from an idea from the daughter of Obayashi, uh, and he really wanted to approach the script, uh, the story idea for the script that he that he had Katsura do uh, from a, a childhood viewpoint. Because he kind of thought that his daughter had an interesting uh, way of looking at kind of like horror and things that, you know, scare her and her fears and everything. Because like adulthood fear versus childhood fear kind of play out in very different ways. So this film really is a visualization and a storytelling of kind of certain fears that could be dealt with at a adult level but at a childhood level and kind of what that looks like and how it's kind of experienced from a childhood mind or in this in this sense kind of teenager but yeah uh the film company toho who put this out had approached obayashi originally to make a film like jaws obviously this is not really like jaws um, although maybe someone could find some ways how it is. Put it in the comments there. Let's do that. Uh, so then he got, that's when he got the idea. He got the script commissions and everything. So the script ended up sitting for two years because Toho couldn't actually find a director who would take it because all of them thought that the film was just, or the script was just so nonsensical that they just didn't want to touch it. They felt like it could really ruin someone's career to put a film like that out. Uh, so in the end, it, you know, it sat for two years. While it was sitting, Obayashi went out and he was doing a lot of um, kind of marketing for the film and really pushing it, even though it hadn't been made at that point. And that included, you know, they got it made into a manga. Uh, they had like a radio drama done of it, which actually did pretty well. Um, and there was something else that they had. I, I'd written it down. I'll get to it at some point. Oh, yeah. And then they also released the soundtrack before they even did the film. Which is, you know, that's an interesting thing, but I guess it's, I guess it's good for marketing because it like starts some hype going. But apparently that was working and people were getting kind of hyped up about it. So then Obayashi went to Toho and was like, look, no one's directing, nobody wants to touch this, let me do it. You know, he advocated for a while and then eventually they said, yeah, you know, just go ahead, you can do it because no one else is going to do it. Uh, upon release of the film, it was actually not favorably reviewed by critics but it did well in theaters, and the audiences seemed to really enjoy the film. Now, it then eventually got a release in the United States much later than 1997, in 2009, and it was better critically uh, reviewed in the United or in North America at that point uh, than it was in Japan initially. But you have to consider, you know, it's decades later, so that's probably naturally going to happen. And, you know, this film's on Criterion Collection at this point. And when I watched it, I watched it on HBO. They grab a lot of Criterion stuff. So, obviously, it's very highly thought of in certain respects. Um, so, Obayashi kind of 
took some themes of the the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and put those into the film uh mainly because he was from Hiroshima he was born there and he lost like all his childhood friends to that atomic bombing obviously that's a terrible thing um that was rolled into a lot of film from the older decades you know it's not so much in Japanese film now but decades ago it was rolled in because that was a, a huge trauma obviously it was a tragedy it was a terrible thing and um yeah it just kept showing up in film over and over and over again people know most that Godzilla kind of played off the you know nuclear weapon atomic fears um and trauma basically of the whole country uh but it shows up again in house and obviously it has a very personal angle from obayashi so i thought that was really interesting to include uh i already talked about that he did not use storyboards obayashi did not use storyboards when he was shooting this and i think that kind of contributed to what i was reading about the crew kind of feeling like the film was a little bit aimless and it was nonsensical like people had already said about the script and that it was kind of a waste of time uh and i think that when you don't have like a plan going into it with storyboards that kind of makes the crew feel more like we're just winging it like what are we doing here so that was kind of the feel on the on the set apparently there was a big focus on nonsensical stuff in the film uh, to make it feel more like the fears of the child's imagination. This is what I was kind of talking about earlier about how, you know, the way that adults view fear and, and children view fear is very different. And that's very much a point of this film and on display in this film. So with the events of the film, the soundtrack immediately hits you as, as its mix of songs that are very childlike and remind you of childhood the way they're composed, but also ones that are just like upbeat and fun. And it's weird because things get mismatched within the film too, where it's like some things that are horror and could be horrific with the right music are actually done to like upbeat fun music. So truly making it like this horror comedy aspect to the film, um, which I think works because it just keeps the film fun. And the other thing is all the crazy stuff that keeps happening. Obviously, I'll talk about some of the crazy things in the film that show up that I thought looked really good or played really well. But I can't cover them all because it would take forever. Uh, but if you want to put in the comments certain ones that you really enjoyed if I don't bring them up or you just want to say, yeah, you brought it up, but I love this one, feel free to do that. Seems like there's a bit of a commentary early on about how restrictive adulthood is. And I think that's at play a little bit because it seems like it seems like there's kind of this idea of, of adults being a little more shackled and kids being a little more free in the film. And it's easiest and earliest scene with the teacher that the two girls and the initial two girls end up talking to who is saying, Oh, you know, she's kind of like opining about them being able to go on a vacation on summer vacation. And she even comments at that same time, about how she's getting married and they're kind of like oh you know congratulations she's like well it's an arranged marriage like insinuating that like she's trapped in that she's not excited about that she's not excited about the fact that she's still working she wishes she could be young like them and have summer vacations so i think part of why this film works is a reminder of of fun and childhood and even though there's horror elements it's still upbeat to a degree so i like that the backgrounds look pretty fake, uh, but uh, they look good the way they're constructed. You can tell they're fake and they feel fakey, but I think it helps maintain this kind of whimsical ambiance and atmosphere for the film, which I think plays really well with the whole childhood, you know, viewpoint of fear and the music being upbeat and interesting. So I like that. There is no natural flow to events, at least not early on in the film. Well, I mean, for the whole film, pretty much. Uh, it seems like it kind of abruptly jumps scenes. It jumps abruptly with dialogue. Like, people bring dialogue up that's just, like, out of nowhere. And it seems, like, really choppy and fast. So early on, I was kind of like, my head was like, oh my gosh, like, slow down. Like, we're moving at a breakneck neck pace. I felt like I was getting, like, whiplash from the movement of the story. Now, I will say that it settles down a bunch much later in the film when it starts to get a little, little more horror-driven, where the house is doing things and kind of consuming the girls. So it slows down more, and it's a little bit easier to kind of take things in and, and process at that point. But early on, it's just like boom, 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 and you're like, what is going on? Let's slow down real, real quick here. 
Um, do, 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 do. There is a consistent practice early on. It it's, doesn't do this as much later, although a little bit. But it, it was consistently doing this thing where they were transition from one shot to another shot, but leave a portion of the previous scene overlaying uh, but transparent the new shot. And in some instances, it was cool. In some instances, I was like, "What? Is, it, it's odd. It doesn't. It doesn't really work." The instance that I thought it was really good and worked was when they were kind of focusing on a skeleton at the house, and then they transitioned to the next scene. And but the skeleton, like the somewhat uh, see-through skeleton image, was still there. That looked cool. But a lot of the other ways they used it, I was just like, "That's. Oh, it's odd. It doesn't work." So. A bunch of the music actually kind of sounds like jingles from a commercial, I started thinking. Uh, that more like upbeat stuff. If you really pay attention, especially early on in the film, it kind of sounds like commercial jingles. Uh, I like the transition of the kids' book to the, um, to the animated train when they first get on the train because they're going to be going to that girl's aunt's house. They show the kid kind of looking at this, you know, children's book with the illustration of a train, and then they transition to like an animation of a train. I thought that was a really cool transition, really cool shot, loved it. And that's the thing, like there's some really awesome visual things that happen in this film that I really, really enjoy. That's just one of them, one of many. And that's one of the things I think I, I like most about the film. Like that's why I had fun watching it. That's why I know I would watch it again is because the visuals are so interesting and cool. Um, the man and woman embracing and then the film burning looks really cool. Now, that was one of those moments of bringing the atomic bombing into play where it was talking about the aunt and her past about waiting for her lover to come back from serving in the war, and he just didn't come back. Now, it shows them embracing, and then it's like burning the actual uh, footage is what it looked like, like the actual physical film. It's just like disintegrating because it's burning. It looked really good, and it's a very good visual of them being destroyed um so i really did enjoy that your first hint of horror coming is when the girls get to the gate of the house and the hawk just like flies past behind them screaming that's your first like little bit of foreshadowing that things are about to go bad and the first potentially scary moment is when the um isn't because of the quick cuts and mismatch music uh sorry the first potentially scary moment is when they, they actually get into the house and the crystals fall from the chandelier. Now, it was potentially scary, but the music and the quick cuts that they use with it make it not scary. But it, it's this weird thing where, like, you realize that something's wrong and things are already happening and they should be scared, but they're not because the music tells you, oh, it's different and the way they reacted and the quick cuts. It just keeps things kind of moving in light and it's weird. But it's interesting. It's its own thing. The aunt talks to her furniture and appliances. I thought that was kind of a funny thing. But I also think that that kind of alludes to the idea that the house is basically alive. Now, the girls don't know that when she says, when she tells them that she kind of talks to the furniture and appliances. Um, but it's this kind of thing. It's like a wink to the audience in a way to let them know, like, the house is actually alive. And that's why the aunt talks to it, basically. So I thought that was pretty cool. I like when the one girl kicks a cabinet door off the wall. I thought that was funny when they heard, like, a mouse or something. Like, she's destroying the <laughs> ant's house. Like, And there are a bunch of things like that that just happen where you're just like, I don't think they would actually do that. But it's funny, and it adds to the film, so I enjoyed it. Uh, the watermelon scene, one of my favorite scenes. The watermelon that they pull out of the well, turning into a severed head, and then biting the one girl on the butt. It was just like... It's just so random, but it looked funny and it looked good. And the way it played out, I loved it. Uh, the hair in the bath scene was pretty creepy. I thought that was well executed when she was in the bath and, like, the black hair just, like, crept up onto her back and onto her shoulder and then it went away. I mean, that's one of those now thought of as typical J-horror uh, tropes. Happens a lot in the films. Uh, it's one of those visuals. Um, I thought it looked good. So... <laughs> I wrote down, so is the ant a spirit or something since she's dancing with the skeleton and eating a hand? There was that first moment where you, where you see the ant is very weird, not just because she talks to the house, but she was like dancing next to the skeleton in the house dancing. And then it shows her sitting down and like eating a human hand. So I think this gets to later on how 
the house and her are kind of consuming the youth, like these girls. And it kind of alludes to from some excerpts from her diary that they find later that she was saying there, there are no more young females in the town. And I think maybe that's because they had been to the house and they were consumed by her and the house, who I think are intertwined spiritually, because she's trying to prolong her life so that she can continue to wait for her lover, who she hasn't dealt with the idea that he's gone. She's still sticking around. And I guess to stay around, it seems that she's become kind of evil and she's feeding off the life of younger women to keep herself alive and keep herself around. And the house is doing the same. And it seems that kind of like the house is more consuming and then it's, you know, kind of feeding into her spirit. But at that moment where she's sitting at the table, like eating a hand, I think that's, she's directly consuming as well. It's a crazy scene. Um, the cat was in this a lot more than I assumed. And the cat ended up being a much bigger part of the story, obviously, because it seems that, the cat was kind of the conduit to get the girls. It was kind of the messenger. It's like this evil familiar messenger to the aunt who was basically kind of a witch who lured the kids in to a degree. And then the cat ends up being the key to kind of starting to destroy the house in the end, which was interesting with like the picture of the cat on the wall and they break it. And then there's all the blood flying out of the mouth of the cat. I can't fully break that down. I can't fully understand that, but that you know the best i could figure is that the cat was kind of the key to breaking everything down and the cat was kind of uh was the way to bring the girls in because the cat you know went through the trip with them and every time you saw like the the green glint in the cat's eyes it was doing things within the house uh the whole mirror sequence is is really cool i really enjoyed that one especially when the girl's face starts falling apart like pieces of a broken mirror falling off and then there's just like a fire underneath which i think that was kind of a little bit of showing that you know the fears of becoming your parent because i think that was the girl who had lost her mother and so when she was looking in the mirror she was seeing her like her image turned into her mother and then it cracked actually the cat cracked it blanche and then her face starts cracking and then falling apart and there's fire under it, insinuating, that, you know, like destruction of her when she was looking like her mother. So I think that was kind of a, a thing of like a fear of, you know, having the same fate as your parent who you lost. Um, or maybe potentially an issue of trying to deal with the loss of the parent and, and her still, you know, holding on. Because there is a portion earlier in the film where her father introduces a new woman and she goes on this this uh tear of like xing her father out of photos because she thinks that her father's betrayed her and her mother because of bringing this woman in so i think that you know it connects but the mirror scene awesome the ghostly arm i thought was a really cool funny moment that was the moment i laughed out loud i think it's the only one i laughed out loud at where the girl's outside and then like the door opens and this arm comes out and is like going like this and you think it's like this ghost arm and the girl reacts as if it is, but then she's like, toilet paper, please, because she sticks her head out. I thought that was a really funny transition. That, that was probably my favorite joke in the film. I, I actually laughed. The film, the, ugh, the film, <laughs> the film hits a tone change to being more horror and being more serious and kind of soaking that atmosphere in when the house locks the girls inside. It's all kind of like fun and games until the house locks them in. And then it really does shift tone. You know, it does kind of go back to the wacky. It goes back to the funny and the comedy a little bit after that, but not nearly as much. Um, it, 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 seem, it seems to want to um, kind of stay more firmly in that horror aspect and make people feel it at that point of the story, which I think works. It's good. The scene of the piano eating the girl is another one of my favorite scenes. It looks awesome. It looks so good. And then the extra touch of the severed fingers on the keyboard, like still playing. Awesome. And I love like when she gets eaten into the piano and she's like back in the, um, in the portion where the, where the uh, chords are that like her hand comes up and they're like attached to her hand. Just visually, it's an amazing scene, and especially for back then in 1977, I think they pulled off some great stuff with this. 
Um, I already talked about, uh, oh, so I already talked about Blanche the cat kind of like being the key to this and being like an evil conduit. But I think that's kind of interesting because it's the reverse of what cats typically are to Japanese culture historically. Because cats kind of insinuate um, typically positive things in general and good luck is another thing. You know, think about the, uh, you know, the waving cat, the, I forget what that's called, but the um, the good luck cat that like waves, it, it, it's tied into good things. And here in this film, it's the total opposite. It kind of brings the girls along maybe with a false sense of good luck and a false sense of positive things to come but then it turns out not at all so i thought that was cool uh, i already talked about that one. Oh, i like <laughs> i like slash don't understand the whole thing with the bananas in the end and when mr togo almost gets to the house and he meets the guy with the watermelons he's like what do you like he's like i don't like watermelons i like bananas and then Togo can't stop talking about it. He's, like, yelling about bananas when he gets into his car. And then later it shows that he just turned into a giant pile of bananas. I guess that's the comedy aspect coming back into the film. But it was really weird. It was craziness. Yeah. So that's all I have to say about the events of the film. Uh, just some things to kind of wrap up. The camera work uh, adds to the fun of the film. Uh, and the light feeling of the film a lot of times. Which I really liked. Because it had a tendency a lot of times to kind of move in playful ways, in addition to, to how they did some of the, you know, quicker cuts. Um, kind of kept it very light and uh, playful, like I was saying. Um, so I kind of viewed this as the aunt not being able to go on and staying in the house to wait for her love to come back from war. And like I said, you know, the whole consumption, consuming the girls in the house and all that. It's kind of this whole thing of, I think she was a ghost at that point. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but it's this whole thing of like restless spirits and not being able to rest because they have unfinished business. She just keeps waiting. Uh, ultimately, this is about coming to terms with losing someone and working through the grief. The house was keeping the aunt trapped in a horror scape, basically because she refused to recognize that her lover wasn't coming back. Now, it seems that in the very end, things are more positive and the house looks normal when the the girl, I think it was gorgeous, the girl, like the, I guess the spirit of her mother comes back and they're kind of face-to-face -face out on the front of the house and everything looks good, everything looks normal at that part, at that point. Now, the cat Blanche is still around because she kind of like runs out at the end, but it seems like things have turned. Things are better. And because it's focusing on Gorgeous, and it seems that maybe she's kind of worked through things and accepted that her mom is no longer there. Um, so that's kind of how I viewed that. But maybe other people have different interpretations. So go ahead and put that in the comments, and we will certainly talk about that. I am 100% open to talking about this film. So. Like I said, I'm going to have to rate this two ways. So just as a film in general, in the pantheon of all film, I'm going to give it th still three stars, I think. Because there's a lot of visually... Visually, there are a lot of things that were really well accomplished in this film. It keeps it fun. It's very engaging to the audience. You don't really feel like it's dragging at any point because things just keep happening. There is a true point to it. There's that underlying theme. So I'm going to give it a three in general. Now... As a so bad it's good film, I'm going to bump it up to a four because it's crazy, it's engaging, it's fun, it's funny. There are definitely things to laugh at intentionally and unintentionally with this film. So, yeah, it's just a good time. So, uh, yeah, those are my feelings on the film. Like I said, whatever comments you want down here, let's get crazy talking about this film. Uh, but do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button if you like this review or any review I've ever done or unboxings or live streams or whatever. Uh, I really do appreciate that. It means a lot to me personally. And whenever I see a new subscriber come into my email because I get those notifications, I feel a lot of gratitude. So I would appreciate that. Uh, but if you are going to do that, also hit the notification bell button. And that way you'll know whenever I'm putting a, a new review or unboxing or doing a live stream. Um, but regardless, I appreciate you taking the time to check this video out. And until next time, keep it brutal.